Then there are the higher shades of Eve. According to my source, the smallest of these is Lanwin, the world of green, made from Jubilee, the energies of life's joys in Universe Alpha. Above that was Nashwin, the world of water, created from fervor, literally concentrated passion. Highest above all is Highwin, what sounds like a land of diamond, made of rapture, the very essence of creation. This is from where my source hails. Excerpt from the Journal of Dr. Francisco Amul, Mercia, December, 1896. The Rapture I saw it. I know I did. Bennett held keen eyes on the sky, leaning on a thick oak tree next to him, feeling a sense of wonder he hadn't experienced since he was a boy. Brilliant white clouds rolled by, yet he was only focused on a single jet stream fading between them. I didn't imagine it. He fought to hold on to the image of the shape zooming across the horizon before it fell out of sight in the hills to the east of his father's gas station, lost in a stretch of forest. Don't forget it. Remember it. The line left in its wake was all the proof he needed. It was real. A coarse wind blew under the dusty jacket he'd thrown on before charging outside. Without a shirt on underneath, it was easy to get cold out here. When Bennett had heard it in the morning, whatever the thing in the sky was, he didn't have time to get properly dressed. He ran as fast as he could, with his newly restored legs and stamina, propelling him after the mysterious object towards the forest. His every moment today had been overrun by bombastic emotions pitching themselves to the surface, dipping him into bouts of depression, only to have him laughing seconds later. Al complained about similar things in the desert. And though he always knew exactly what Alex was talking about, Bennett never reciprocated vocally. To him, they were less voices and more raw emotions and strange desires pulling him in one direction or another. Inaudible whispers, clear on their intent, like an audience at a television taping, watching his every move, judging him with malice. When he and Alex arrived with the mystery woman, Mara, on a cool afternoon a couple of days ago, Bennett thought he'd confirmed a theory he'd been holding on to. The concept of the Medolian shift was so obtuse, so ridiculous, that when he'd experienced it a second time, he concluded it could only have been a hallucination. There was no other way to explain how they could have traveled so far so fast. It must have been a dream. All of it. His suicide, the desert riders, Joseph, surviving Africa. Everything had been a grand adventure through his own mind. A spiritual journey. Is there some lesson I'm supposed to be learning? He was more than ready to wake up in an alley, covered in his own vomit. Try as he might, Bennett could not stop thinking about Isaiah, the mission, and Joseph. What did he mean by being the third lord? Is that why heaven and hell would be so scared of this guy? The man in the mask had killed Yuri, and left Bennett and Alex with the Raytheon cult. For that alone... Bennett felt invested in whatever mission promised to take him down, even if it was all a dream. The prospect of hopping back into his old life as an unemployed drunk was promising in many ways, but one thing Bennett had been having trouble with lately was keeping his priorities straight. Something about all of the craziness. Guess it did seem pretty real. The soldier's first action after being rescued by Mara and returning to Prescott was to find his truck. If it had all been a dream, that would mean his baby would still be in the garage he'd hidden it in the day the cops tried to chase him down. Bennett marched downtown, sticking to the service roads he knew, avoiding crowds, eventually rounding the corner of the quadplex. The garage was open, but his truck was not in it. With that option closed, his apartment was next. As he trekked the other way across town, a newspaper and a trash can caught his eye. The header date read, Saturday, October 21st, 2006. 
It had been 31 days since his suicide attempt. The dream theory was already showing seams. Across town, his apartment complex was quiet, as always, but Bennett approached using stealth nonetheless. For all he knew, there might have been cops posted nearby to watch for his return. He half-wished he could find one just to ask them some questions, wanting to know if the young woman, Autumn, had been permanently injured from his assault. That same part of him wanted to turn himself in no matter the answer. First, he checked his numbered parking spot beneath a rusty overhang. No truck. After climbing the steps of the building, Bennett made his way to his door and took out his ring of keys, still in his pocket. Finding the right one, he fitted inside the deadbolt, but it would not turn. Noticing a letter taped to the door stamped with the Arizona state seal, he tore it open and read. In so many words, the letter stated the apartment had been forcefully vacated and was ready to lease. His belongings had been put on the curb weeks ago. Through the living room blinds, the space looked practically empty, except for some buckets of paint, brushes, cleaning supplies, and plastic tarps in the corner, leaving no indication he'd ever lived there at all. Taking the door handle, ready to snap it off, he found it unlocked. With a deep breath, he stepped in and shut the door. There was no point in turning on the lights. He could see fine. The apartment had been redone, top to bottom. No more holes in the drywall or cigarette burns in the carpet. They'd even fixed the small bathroom window he'd thrown a miniature tequila bottle through one particularly shit-faced Ash Wednesday. Passing the kitchen threshold, he paused, looked at the ground, and saw her fall again in his mind. Autumn, I'm sorry. The frigid cold in his gut returned in force as the voices of judgment swelled, reminding him how weak he'd been that day, how he'd taken it out on her in order to feel strong. Coward. Bennett knelt and grazed his fingers along the cabinet door where her head had broken through, once jagged and sharp as knives, since repaired. Whoever might move in would have no idea what evils had transpired here. A flash ran up his spine. Bennett's chest tightened. You are responsible for not only that young person's pain, but a lot of other people's too. You know that, right? This time, Bennett didn't fight the weight on his mind as he made his way to the bedroom. It was empty, same as the others. Just hope they missed one thing. Opening the closet, he felt behind the radiator box taking up its lower left half. Thank God. His hand came back holding an envelope, its paper feeling dry and rough in his fingers, fragile in its age. At first, Bennett could only stare, still more afraid of what was inside the envelope than any enemy he'd ever faced on the battlefield. A distant police siren broke his days. Pocketing the envelope, he hurried out of the apartment and snuck away before anyone got wise to him. Out of options, he began a trek to the only location left on his list where he might discover the truth. Two hours later, on foot, he reached his father's station, where a huge shadow came into view, lingering out front. His truck, right where he'd left it, lights off and the driver's side door shut. Damn. Score one for Isaiah. Bennett stretched up on his toes to peer into the cab, seeing the bottle of whiskey on the floor in the back. He expected himself to crawl in to retrieve it for a drink, and was pleasantly surprised when he had no desire to. Huh. Just not feeling it. Marching up the cracked concrete outside his dad's shop, he found himself nervous. Each step felt akin to giving up somehow. A release of his fears and himself both liberating and terrifying all at once. Bennett entered the station and found the door to his father's office open. Stepping inside, he saw the picture frames smashed and bullet holes that had ripped through the walls. At his feet were remnants of the photo of his family. Jerry's face was gone, ripped asunder. Of course it is. An intense stream of memories, all of Bennett's wrongdoings, came rushing back completely out of his control, 
like he'd been plugged into a computer and was receiving data. Feeling all of it at once made part of Bennett want to curl up and find death again. He fought the information, as he always did his memories and guilt, and kicked the photo away. The fuck is going on with me? Rounding the desk, Bennett found the one thing he was hoping, praying, not to see. The one thing he could have used as leverage to prove to himself he hadn't tried to blow his brains out. But there it sat. The revolver shimmered in the pale moonlight, a toy left out on a rug by a child. You stupid little... Kneeling, he picked it up and released the cylinder with his thumb. The empty casings clattered to the floor, where streaks of dried blood led to the chair, illuminated by a beam of moonlight pouring through a hole punctured through the glass. Leaning against the desk, Bennett set the gun in his lap, and reached for the letter stuffed into his back pocket. As he opened it, his hand began to shake. Hey, little brother. Thank you for your last letter, and the peanut butter cookies from Grandma Waters. Half the squad's allergic, so more for me. Not gonna lie, things are bleak. Which I get is weird to say considering what I do, but still, things seem to be changing. Feels like something big is going down. They gave us some new guys I'm not sure about. Don't get me wrong. Badasses all around who signed up like me and want to help. But these guys seem to be fighting for a different America from the one I thought we lived in. Plus, they remind me of Dad, which is never good. So... Commanders say we're liberating people. The looks on the faces I see say otherwise. Sorry. Still can't say what or where the op is. Tell mom I wish I could. The guys still don't know about me. I know you said I should tell them. Just not sure how they would react after all these years. It's okay. I can bear it. I did for the first 18 years of my life. But enough about me. How are you and that new girl? Was it Laura? Sorry. If so, hope it's going well. You deserve an outlet. Someone to talk to other than me. If you're still having a hard time with your anger, stop and think about what's important to you, and focus on how you can help that instead. Channel all that fury. Your heart will lead you straight. You'll see. Just do what you can, little brother. Just like King Arthur, right? And never discount the healing properties of helping others. Give Cody a hug and a kiss for me. Tell him his dad is coming home soon. Love, Jerry. There were no more letters. Six months later, Jerry was dead. A month after that, Bennett was in a recruitment office. Running. That's all I was doing. His eyes focused on his nephew's name. The one he'd promised his older brother he would take care of, should the worst happen. When it did, and Jer was killed, Bennett's father stepped in and took the child from his boyfriend, who had no legal recourse. Cody, I abandoned you. Left you with... How could I? A swell of voices grew in Bennett's mind, like the whispers, multiplied by a thousand. Covering his ears did nothing to soften the clamor. Sweat dripped from his brow and froze on his cheek as the stream of his past injustices poured through his mind. Why? Why did I choose to be this? What did I ever do for anyone else? All I do is hurt people. Clutching the letter and gun with both hands, sobbing, Bennett wanted to scream, to lash out and break the world. He wanted more bullets to play roulette all over again. Always running. Always hurting. He wanted to feel the pain he'd caused, and finally take the blame he secretly knew deep down he'd always wanted. Yet he could only sink lower and ultimately feel pity for himself, clutching the backrest of the desk chair, grasping for equilibrium. I've been fucking weak because I allowed myself to be. The worst shit I've ever done was the shit I got roped into. Like a drone, unable to think for itself. Not like Jerry. He never took the easy way. Didn't play everyone else's game. 
He didn't blame other people for his own shit. He was everything I'm not. Broken glass and debris on the ground rattled like a dozen tambourines, met with the cracking and splintering of the backrest in his grasp. Beneath him, the wooden floor moaned under his weight, as a deep rumble grew from the cold center in Bennett's gut, and a new voice appeared in his mind, clear as day. There. I finally remember. The voice was that of his brother, Gerald. Do what good you can. An explosive pop shook the walls as cobalt blue, white, and violet light sprang from him, illuminating the station. The aura was everywhere, most concentrated at his spine. Bennett's clothes dissolved as he clenched his knees to his chest, feeling the streams of light breaking free of his shirt, striking the ceiling of the shop, shoving him into the floor. Frigid cold blasted across his skin, as a tremendous pressure was released from a well within him that he was experiencing but had no way of understanding. Spherical waves extended from Bennett's left hand, coursing through the chair and all nearby matter, transforming it into a cold, raw umber mass, retaining the shape of the object. The bulk of the chair, the corner of the desk, a circle around Bennett in the ground, all were changed. Vines and colorful flowers seeped through cracks opening in the dense material as it settled, slithering outward in a furious, brief burst of life. With a final grand flash, the light faded, and Bennett was left in the dark station once more, kneeling at the center of a strange, beautiful dark mass. His legs found purchase, and he rose, finding himself in the mirror, naked, his skin steaming, covered in a paper-thin layer of ice, which broke away and fell as he moved, only to be replaced by more. And its back and shoulders, once covered by tattoos, were now blotted by clean skin traced with a line of twisting, cobalt-blue scarring in the shape of wings, as if they'd landed and cleansed everything beneath them. Even his birthmarks and freckles were gone. The old tattoos around the wings remained, but now looked like a cookie cutter had been taken to them. Damn. Paid good money for that ink. The night droned on as Bennett sat silently, hardly breathing, thinking about what had just happened. After losing track of time and his thoughts, he was suddenly stirring the next morning, waking when a distant boom shook the bits of glass on the floor. That was when he sensed the object in the sky. Springing out of his father's chair, he looked out the window to see a small shape, which definitely had wings, but was hard to make out otherwise. Grabbing some shop pants, boots, a jacket, and his keys, he was soon in his truck and careening over rough desert hills, trying to keep pace with the UFO. This is so stupid. So stupid. What am I doing? Splitting his time watching the road and gawking at the shape, Bennett swore he saw a person between the wings for a split second, and he soon found himself slamming on the brakes at the forest line, narrowly missing a massive acacia tree. His Ford stumbled up an embankment filled with vines and halted, letting out a cough of smoke. Without pausing, Bennett dove out and took off on foot through the trees, leaping over rocks and fallen trunks, keeping his eyes upward as best he could without tripping. Finally, a clearing broke and swept into an open valley just in time for him to see the figure rocketing through the atmosphere with one final colossal push of its wings. A high-pitched whoosh flooded over the forest as a blinding ring of crystalline light exploded in the sky, followed by the same boom he'd heard earlier. The sound wave struck his chest like a fist, shoving him back, and when he looked again the winged shape was gone, as if it had vanished into thin air. Marching to the edge of the clearing, Bennett leaned against the oak tree and gazed over the green and brown landscape. It couldn't have been a... could it? At present, leaning against the same tree, Bennett waited for another boom to roll over the desert, or another winged shape to dance through the sky 
but the afternoon remained stubbornly peaceful. Birds sang overhead. The forest was alive with the sounds of life, reminding him of when he would play inside it as a boy when his father did not have any chores for him at the station. Walking past a thick tree in the center of a clearing, where he'd built his first treehouse, he rounded the far side and found three overgrown planks hung by a few rusty nails in the old bark. The only bits left. Used to be bigger. A voice seemed to whisper from the brush behind him. A presence. He turned, but nothing was there. Bennett stuck out his hand and moved forward, waving it, knowing how foolish he looked, but also knowing the truly foolish thing was that he half expected to touch something. Perhaps someone invisible. At this point, who fucking knows? But his hand passed harmlessly through air. The sun was streaming through gaps in the trees, casting beams through the dense forest. Passing a small bubbling stream, he knelt and splashed a few handfuls on his face, feeling a thin layer of water freeze over his skin. Clenching his fist, he watched the ice flake off into the water and float downstream, only to be replaced by more. Huh. Stopped drinking right when I could have iced my own drinks. Bennett's gaze was on the water's surface when he sensed another set of eyes on him. Across the stream, a buck had stopped for a drink. A doe soon strode up behind the buck and knelt with it at the water's edge, followed by a small herd stepping out from the tree line. Bennett stood, having gotten his fill, and to his amazement the deer did not scatter. Maybe they're all blind. Get out of here. He waved his hand, but the herd just stared curiously for a moment before returning to the water. Go on. The first buck moved to the rear of the group and lay in the shade of a tall tree. A few of the others joined him while the youngest deer finished, a doe with white spots and shaky legs. She lingered before Bennett, her deep black eyes fixated on him. What do you want? he asked with an annoyed grunt, shaking his head and thrashing his hair with his hands to dry off, hoping the swift movement would startle the doe. When he looked back, she hadn't budged. Your friends are over there, he said, leaning down to splash it. The doe flinched, took one last look at him, and scurried off. Finally. Bennett marched away before any of them could start following him and made his way through the forest losing all sense of where he was in relation to the station and his truck. He also found himself scratching his shoulders a lot. The insignia that had erased his tattoos itched worse than any of them ever had. Guess there's no point pretending none of it happened when I got the proof on my back. Bennett then began feeling another presence. It was not like the other voices he'd been hearing, the judgmental assholes he was beginning to refer to as the jury. No. This was more human. Like the others, this voice was more a heap of suggestions than actual words, but ones which felt familiar. Whatever was creating the signal was clearly in pain, and there was sadness, too, strong enough to be palpable. Bennett set out, finding when he closed his eyes it was easier to see with whatever this newfound sight was. Like the glow of a city beyond the horizon at night, he could sense where this soul was, and soon found himself traveling from dirt, rock, and trees to concrete and urban settings. Passing under tall street lamps casting orange light onto the highway, broken medians, and abandoned farmhouses, he soon found himself on cracked, debris-covered roads, treading through neighborhoods and eventually through the southern business district of Prescott. While walking, he kept his head low and listened and felt. The citizens of town passed by, giving off faint smells, often of something he could recognize, which evoked not memories, as most scents do, but emotions. The people gave off pure feelings, telling the truth as plainly as a rotten egg, hints at their true thoughts and desires. There was much less anger than he expected, and much more sadness. Humanity, at least these few dozen people, were not like he imagined. They felt weary, so much so that Bennett had to stop several times and take a break from the weight of the sensations. The fuck's wrong with you people? 
Throughout the march, the first burst he'd sensed remained the loudest, and Bennett could feel he was getting closer, and he wondered if the angry soul knew he was coming. Could be a trap. An ominous feeling came over him as a heavy rain began to fall, and the painful energy grew into a blaring, chaotic bubble. Much of what Bennett felt was rage and hatred, enough to turn his stomach. Then, as the storm over the valley peaked, the source of anger in the distance began to subside as well. By the time he entered a public stretch of land on the southwest edge of Prescott, the energy had become faint, as had the rain, reduced to a sprinkle. Finding himself surrounded by bush-filled desert, whose earthly sense had been kicked into the air by the rain, he followed the path he'd set himself on, mostly mud by now. Then, spotting a looming, mushroom-shaped tree in the middle of a field with a dark shape resting at its base, Bennett's gaze found a familiar face, that of a frightened teacher without his blue baseball cap. Barker? He hurried up to Alex, who seemed half awake, wrapped in a wet, dirty blanket he must have found on the street or in a bush somewhere. Al? What happened? Alex said nothing. Christ, you're burning up, man. Talk to me. Where were you these past couple days? Alex stirred but remained quiet. Look, I've been thinking. I know what happened to you. I'm not stupid. And just as in the dark as you are about why we didn't go to different places when we died. Feels like a fucked up joke, you ask me. You're a good man. I should have gone through the... Anyways, I'm not good at talking. Especially about shit like this. So... Bennett sat on the ground next to Alex, where he remained a long moment in silence, before feeling compelled to try again. Sometimes people need to talk, you know? Alex began to laugh with a voice sounding like he'd smoked a thousand packs of cigarettes in the last two days. A petty laugh, filled with ill will. So, that's a Sergeant Hunter apology? Please, I'm trying to be real with you, Al. I know it doesn't mean much, but... Alex laughed again. It means less than nothing. You don't know what I've done, and I don't know what you've done. No one knows anything, not even God, who, by the way, doesn't seem to exist, at least not from where I'm sitting. Alex turned to Bennett with excited eyes, like an addict who just remembered he was holding. Hey, we should find a way to kill ourselves. Bennett chuckled, but out of worry. Couple days ago, I would have been right there with you. And now? Alex asked with an air of excitement. Bennett shook his head. That's not how you do things, Al. There's nowhere for us now. If we do it together, to each other, we might not go to the fire. I need this, Bennett. You need to chill. We'll figure this out. Just like we figured everything out so far. How can you say that? Like we're partners. Like we succeeded. I'd call what we went through anything but success. Steam was rising from the blanket wrapped around Alex. Do you know what was taken from me? I was about to have a family. And it was taken. And yet, there was nothing I could do about it. Isaiah? Joseph? The kid at the restaurant? You? All making moves against me. And I don't know why. My life is gone and I can't defend myself. She's gone. If she saw me. Oh God, if she saw me. Saw you? Bennett asked. Who? Alex was staring at his steaming hands like they'd strangled his mother. I wanted to kill him. So badly. I wanted to kill everyone. I wanted to find blood. See it. I wanted to punish the ones who did this to me. I wanted... I just want this to end. You're not the only person yanked from their life, Bennett said. 
What life did you ever have? Alex asked bitterly. A bit of one. The teacher was shouting now. I don't care about you. I never have. You're like a freaking ghost to me. We're both ghosts, Al. Stop speaking in facts. You sound like a robot. Speak from your hollow chest for once. Go on. Tell me. How is it on your end of the eve? I want to know. Is it clouds and sunshine? You want to try mine? And my name is Alex, by the way. Alexander James Barker. I know that you're hurting. Then it started. You don't know anything. You don't know where I went. And I don't know where you went when you died. Or how it happened. We're not in this together. Never were. You always say you think I'm a figment of your imagination? Well, I think you're a pretty fucking thinly crafted figment of mine. Alex wrapped himself tighter in his blanket, trying to contain the smoke. So, this is wrath. Bennett would never be able to forget it now. What he'd first felt when Yuri was about to be killed. The energy was volatile and left a horrible feeling in his gut. He wondered if Alex truly knew what was lurking within him. They sat in silence for a few minutes, letting tempers cool off. Since I've been back, it's been a nightmare. Then it began. I know the truth now. We might not be dead, but our lives are. I'm not going to fight it anymore. I've seen things too. Heard them. I didn't want to admit it. It's crazy, right? Then, last night... Alex looked up. What? I felt... well... Bennett stood and unzipped his jacket, releasing a plume of steam, and the wings outlined with dead scar tissue of his own. Patches of his chest were veiled with thin layers of ice. I don't hear the voices anymore. At least not the same way. I can feel it. The rapture. It's there. But I'm not scared of it. Alex looked away, uninterested. Makes perfect sense. Why would yours be scary? I think I can control it. I think we can use it. To do what? What we were made to. What we died for, Bennett said. Alex stood and removed the blanket covering him, revealing the bull-headed scar across his chest. This is not control. This is being railroaded, and it's already taking over. I did something horrible. And it's because of this shit they... I can't be good, right? How could I? I have evil inside me. You're not evil. You're Alex Barker, a grown man who chooses to spend his time teaching dumb little asses their letters and numbers so they can go be customer service representatives and who hopefully lets some of your good nature rub off on them so that they can at least be non-shitty people while they do it. People who make the world less shitty are the opposite of evil. And I don't know how the hell someone like me got saddled wielding divinity, but I'm going to give it a shot, because it's our only shot. It's our one option, Al. Tell me you don't see him when you close your eyes. Who? Alex asked. You know who. Joseph, Alex said under his breath. A bitter wind swept by, scattering sand over the valley and through the tree above them. Once faded, it was replaced with a familiar, scratchy voice. You should listen to him. The men spun to see a dirty coat and wrinkled face come into the light. Isaiah leaned on his cane. I know this isn't the best time. But I need you both to come with me. Now. <laughs>